Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I want to welcome all of you, and on behalf of the organizers, I would like to thank you all for coming to this uh, meeting in honor of Robert Perlis, our colleague and our friend, and in some cases, teacher and mentor. Um, I don't want to give a long speech, um, but I do want to say a few words. I came here in, I believe it was 1979, so I'm one of the oldest people in the room in terms of service here in the LSU math department. I notice there are a few people here who've been here longer. Um, I, in fact, my memory is the first person I met here was Caruth McGeehee, and shortly thereafter I met uh, Jack Ohm, who is no longer with us. And my memory of Perlis, my first memory is that I was, I believe I complained to Jack. I said, how come there's no number theory here in the math department? And, and Ohm, Jack Ohm said, well, we're hiring this guy, Robert Perlis, who I believe came in 1980. Is that right, Robert? Yeah, so it was just the year after I got here. So we've had number theory at LSU since that time. And Robert has had a very successful career. Um, we've heard a little bit about it in some of the talks here. We've heard about his results about zeta functions and quality of zeta functions. Uh, we didn't hear much about his work on trace forms, but he also worked on that with Pierre Connor, who was another uh, famous professor here. Uh, I guess Pierre is still alive, but he's, not, as I understand, not in good health, perhaps. But he's, he was one of Robert's uh, collaborators. Jürgen Hurlbrink. In fact, I had a long list of people who were his collaborators. And it's quite a, quite a long list. I noticed there are some people who, Rick Litherlin, for example, worked with Robert. And I think several other people in this room have written papers with Robert Perlis. Uh, uh, so I don't want to go on and on about his, his mathematics. This is what the conference meetings are about. Uh, I guess you're all expecting me to tell some funny story about how we went out and got drunk one evening and, and some funny, <laughs> funny ex story like that. I have to admit that when I was young, I did go out and get drunk, maybe with some, maybe with some of the members here but I, whose names will not be mentioned. But You know, I never partied, so to speak, with Robert that way, so I've never been that close to him. But he's always been a good colleague here, and, uh, you know, in addition to his mathematical talents, he has good human qualities, uh, his good judgment, his sense of humor. And he served this department very well. He was chairman for many years, and uh, of course I'm proud to count him as one of my friends and as my colleague. So I don't have much more to say about it than that. Um, I want to invite anybody else who wants to come up here and, and say something. Um, maybe we'll start with our current chairman, um, uh, Oliver Dasbach. Maybe you'd like to come up and say something. Yeah, so uh, I never got drunk with Robert. <laughs> I didn't know that you would do these things. <laughs> I wish I would have known before. <laughs> So, but Robert told me over the years lots of stories. I, I think he got his degree in 72, and then had this mathematical rumspringer uh, in Germany for eight years. He spent time in Regensburg, as far as I remember, and then many years in Bonn under Hirzebruch. And uh, so for the last 37 years, he was at LSU, spent a year at the NSF, as far as I remember, as program director there. And, well, the one thing that always really impressed me about Robert was his devotion to uh, teaching students and educating students. He, uh, many years, uh, was participating in our summer program for undergraduate students, our RU. And this morning in the talks, we heard some of their results. I mean, one of the results of one of the RU students was actually mentioned in one of the talks, which I thought was very impressive. And so over the years, he had 17 PhD students, which is quite a lot. I remember some conversations that I had with James Oxley, and James didn't know whether he was the one who had the most students in the department or whether it was Robert. But 
17 is the number that you have to beat, in case you didn't beat it yet. <laughs> and so then he was chair for many years, uh, for six years from 2010 to 2016. And the only thing what I want to actually say here is that thank you on behalf of the department for everything you did for the department, for everything you did for the students, for the undergraduate students, for the PhD students. Um, next, perhaps Niels would like to say something. So, as some marks that I figured out. So, Robert, congratulations on your illustrious academic career, professor, NFS rotator, departmental chair, director of, well, you heard 17 dissertations combined with the usual grants, conferences, and teaching. I was asked to give a short remark, which I will restrict to those remarks suitable for a general audience. <laughs> I believe I was the first to meet Rob in person after he accepted a position at LSU. For you see, he was in Bonn, Germany at the time. Our first meeting was in the colloquium room at Bonn, where, where I was visiting while staying at the University of Geneva. I'm not sure when I first met his son Alex, certainly in the fall of Rob's arrival at LSU, but I knew Susan in her previous career as a Prentice Hall book representative. And Rachel, who's here, and David, who's not, I both watched grow from infancy to adulthood in Baton Rouge. During Rob's first years at LSU, we matched wits through our common interest in quadratic form together with Pierre Connor and later Jürgen Hurlbrink. There are also many stories from our common year association with the LSU Math REU program. Each summer, 12 enterprising undergraduates were brought to campus eager to, eager to develop new mathematics. One of the more memorable anecdotes was the year of the scavenger hunt. Rob had constructed a list of seven interesting objects to find around LSU. Most notable, the Escher Stairs, the Eight Planet Freeze, and the Pirate Tree. The enterprising students took the list to the reference desk at the library, where they were told in no uncertain terms, we don't do scavenger hunts at LSU. <laughs> and a blazing email was sent back to the faculty REU directors. Parenthetically, the library detested scavenger hunts because sometimes the item to be found was a book that then turned up missing later in the, in the, in the library. Needless to say, we changed the name of the list and warned all students not to seek help in the library. So in his teaching of undergraduates, Roberts noted for the incorporation of community service projects into the, into the curriculum. So, in conclusion, Robert and family, I wish you well as you continue your further explorations in serving the community. Well, is there anyone else among the faculty who would like to say something? Anybody? Yes? Okay. Oh, wait, wait, wait. We'll get to the students later. Um, yes, next maybe friends and colleagues, perhaps Noriko, would you like to say something? It's very nice meeting, Robert. Congratulations for First retirement, I presume. <laughs> he will be coming back. <laughs> yes, um, my um, first um, meeting with Robert uh, was in Bonn. Um, this was um, the, something called SFB 40. It's a predecessor of Max Planck Institute in Bonn, 1977 that I recall. Uh, 
so Alex was there and we met regularly in Robert's apartment. So he, he I, I vividly remember he wrapped up small potatoes in the aluminum foil and put in the oven. That's the dinner. <laughs> we had that his parties. And it was great. Yeah, and then um, so um, Don Zagie was also there. So uh, <coughs> sort of three of us got a very good, became very good friend. And then um, after one year, I left to Saarbrücken to uh, continue my postdoc. But occasionally I went back to Bonn. Robert was still there. But about the same time, uh, I think uh, Robert came to LSU. I went to Ohio State. And Robert also came to visit me at Ohio State. But I hated there. Couldn't stay there. Uh, uh, so Robert came here, and then uh, after, after Ohio State, I went to Canada, and then uh, Robert invited me several times to come down here. And one entry to the U.S., I got rejected. I, I couldn't get in. So, <laughs> the Pierre Corner was uh, having a colloquium dinner at his house, but um, I couldn't arrive for my colloquium talk. That was uh, 83 or 84 or something. Uh, so the, my uh, friendship to, uh, with Robert goes back all the way. And I think um, he met Susan once he came here, and that's the best thing happened to his life. <laughs> I think. <laughs> yeah, so happy retirement. But I um, hope you you'll do mass, keep doing mass. Okay? Peter, would you like to say something? <clears throat> yeah, Robert. I remember very well when I met you first. It was about four o'clock in the evening in the afternoon. That was at Beringstraße uh, 1, also at the Sonderforschungsbereich. Some are mentioning the possibility to be, um, to talk about having been drunk together with Robert. I don't remember that we have been drunk, but many people don't remember that they have been drunk. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember that once um, Robert came and said to me that there is the Bourbaki uh, symposium in, in Paris and he asked me whether I come with and so we went with the crowd and then in the evening there was a wine shop at some place and then I saw Robert looking at these fantastic bottles and he said ah oh, they have Don Perignon this is the most famous champagne I would love to have once in my life a Don Perignon and then I thought well maybe I will have the occasion once to offer you a bottle of Don Perignon and I'm sorry that it took so long. <laughs> yeah, and thank you uh, for this fantastic uh, meeting which is really, uh, it's really, it's very, very nice. Thank you. Anybody else among the uh, friends of Robert who would like to get up and say something? Uh, maybe Sula, would you like to say something? Sula? Well, I could say something. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Sula, the, ca the camera won't, won't hear you. We don't. Huh? The camera won't hear you if you're sitting here. <laughs> Anyway, I remember when I first came to, to LSU, Dr. Perlis was not married at the time, 
And Alex was how old? Six or seven? Eleven? Eleven? Yeah. Well, he was eleven. And in the math department where the supply room is now was all the mailboxes that were on, on, um, on combination. And so Alec would be on his rollerblades going up and down the hall on the third floor, and then he would go and do all those combinations. Well, one day this rep from um, Pier uh, Pearson? Prentice Hall, excuse me, came and Man, the end of that hall where Dr. Prellis was, it was just lit up like a doggone Christmas tree. And I thought, oh my God, his lights are on. Something's going to happen here. <laughs> and doggone if it wasn't Susan made turn the lights on. And I still see the lights burning, and I think that's very nice. Well, maybe now we should hear from some of his students. Was it uh, I th Tommy? Would you like to give a? Hello, my name is Tommy Palfrey. I graduated in 1989. Robert was my major professor. I had just been at University of Utah where some very, very intelligent people were having trouble finishing because they had chosen an advisor who just couldn't get them through, despite the fact they had excellent education and were very intelligent. So when I came to LSU, Robert was the uh, head of the graduate program, and so I got to meet him there. He was a very nice, kind, considerate person, but I was very preoccupied with trying to find someone in a field that I was interested in that I could finish in a reasonable amount of time. And so uh, it turned out Robert ended up having a lot of students. Uh, there was Jenna Carpenter, who everybody knew was going to be a big success from the beginning because she was totally organized and smart. And Pat was pretty organized too, but I was totally disorganized. And, uh, but Robert was always there, not only as a teacher, but as a friend and with sound practical advice. And I remember him telling me, Tommy, you can live just as well with a PhD as without a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, yeah, I'm pretty stupid, but even that, so obviously even I can accept that. And so um, he was there uh, when I needed him. I worked with him and Pierre. Uh, we were nice, uh, lucky enough to visit Pierre last year in New Orleans together. That was a very nice, special moment. And so Robert and Pierre were probably the two most instrumental people in my getting a degree uh, and then ending up at Xavier University where I got tenure. And um, so it's, it was, to me, one of the biggest testimonies to him that he did uh, enable 17 students to graduate and uh, get their PhDs because it's a great responsibility having a PhD student and it's a great responsibility in their able to finish in a reasonable amount of time. I remember, I think, uh, we would have social events together in the department. I think one Halloween we went by Robert's house. And so there was always this great uh, sense of fellowship, uh, relaxation. Uh, as we all know, there are certain professors we have in grad school that we like, but we don't really feel that comfortable with. And I always felt really comfortable with Robert and I always felt that everybody else did that he was very intelligent, he explained things really, really well when we were having trouble understanding things, and that was very important to us. But I think the most important thing for the group that I was with was that we always felt like we had someone leading us in the right direction, helping us with our careers, and was going to be a friend for ours for life. Thank you. Maybe we can hear from Stella Ashford. I've been thinking and thinking what I was going to say to you, Robert. And I, I didn't write anything down. But one thing I can say is that when you touch my life, you touch the life of my children, 
and even now my grandchildren. And mine too. And, <laughs> <laughs> and so the best thing that I can say is a big thank you. You were there for me when, when I thought that I wasn't going to be able to go any further. I remember when I was at MIT, I called you a lot, and I, not to apologize for that, but I had a paper that I submitted to Dr. Anthony for publication in the Journal of Number Theory. And I left my notes and everything, and so I couldn't, uh, Dr. Anthony, Dr. Anthony was asking me about uh, local root numbers. And it would, it would have been Christmas before I could get to them. And so each week he would ask me about it. And I called Robert, and Robert was, I think you must have been asleep. And, and you, you didn't say anything, you just talked a little bit. And then I said, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna tell him to just forget about the paper. But then Robert woke up, and he said, <laughs> he said, no, you don't want to do that. <laughs> and then he gave me a, a lecture on local root numbers over the phone. Uh, and then you re reminded me that Dr. Tate, John Tate, was at Harvard, and that I should start going to his classes, and I did. And I, I just want to thank you so much, Robert. And I love you so much. Pat Bollier like to say something? <laughs> She's not here? Oh, here she is. Hi, y'all. In 1985, a Southern African American female hailing from Alabama, was on a direct course to meet a northern Caucasian male hailing from Indiana at Louisiana State University. And in mathematics genealogy, Robert Perlis was my major professor, but I also found him to be a major professor, possessor of integrity, character, selflessness, and just an all-around kind human being. And when I was kicked out of the nest, that is, I graduated from LSU and made my way in the world, I realized you really can't come home again because every time you look around, you wanna have lunch? I call from Lafayette. You wanna have lunch? Never said no. And so Dr. Perlis, I thank you for being the wind beneath my wings and for making an impact in my life. And Estella, I love you. And thank you, Susan, for sharing him with us. Well, would any of the other students of Robert Perlis like to come up and say a few words? Okay, Carly. Bear with me, I would be much more comfortable if I was teaching you all some math. I'm not used to giving speeches about other things, but um, I graduated in 2008. Um, every year I take some of my students to the Nebraska conference for undergraduate women in math. And a couple of years ago, the keynote speaker uh, spoke about a phenomenon that she called the imposter syndrome. And I had never heard of it before, at least with not with that name. But as she began to, to describe this, I really felt like she was describing my experience word for word. Um, during my undergraduate career, I often had professors encourage me to go to graduate school and tell me, you can do it. You have what it takes to be successful. And I remember thinking, how have I fooled them so well into thinking that I could do that? 
If only they know how lost I feel the vast majority of the time. Um, little did I know what a common feeling this was, and it was kind of uh, comforting to know that I wasn't alone in this. Um, but when I came to LSU and started working with Dr. Perlis, those feelings of inadequacy and insecurity finally started to go away. When I was an undergraduate, I often had questions that I was afraid to ask. I was worried my secret would come out, that everybody would find out that I was a fraud, and I didn't know as much as they thought I knew, and that I would be exposed. Uh, but Dr. Perlis had an approachability that made me feel comfortable enough to ask questions. He made me realize that I really should be here, and that I really could do this. Uh, he changed my life. I love my job, and I get paid to do what I would probably do for free anyway. And he deserves a lot of the credit for that. Um, he has enriched my life immeasurably and uh, instills the confidence in me that I needed to be successful. And I can't thank you enough. Anybody else would like to give a short speech? Okay. Bear Coughlin. I already shared some of my experience experiences with Dr. Perlis uh, in that uh, small room in the talk. Uh, but I agree uh, with all of you. Still, Patricia, uh, uh, he doesn't touch my life. He touched my wife's <laughs> lives, my kids' lives. That's so true. And I never felt uh, insecure in his office. Whatever questions I had, I could just ask without any hesitation. He always cared so much about my progress. Uh, the other thing I said earlier, I again want to share in the, in the last group. I came to LSU in the fall of 2009. And in the summer of 2010, I was still a first year graduate student. So it was, I don't know now, but at that time, it was not easy to get assistance or any type of assistance in the, in the first summer. So I had talked to Dr. Perlis, uh, but uh, at that time he didn't say anything to me. And later, he emailed me, I went to his office, and uh, he asked me whether I wanted to teach Math 1100. And, and, I, and I, I asked him, can I teach because I have an accent? And he told me that, well, we're, math itself is a language. We can do it. I said, well. And he said later, but you have to teach plural pairs. And plural pairs, I, I knew nothing about football. I, I was from other part of the world. And, and he said, don't worry, you don't have to teach football. You have to teach math. And I was still hesitant whether, and, and then he, he comforted me saying, well, you teach math to them. And they teach football to you. Is that fair? I said, OK. But still, I was, can I teach football? I don't know. Then that summer, I taught math 1100 to floor players. What happened was, after the semester was over, my American friends, they started asking about football to me. Like how, how is Saints doing or how is Atlanta Falcons doing, something like that. Then I realized, oh, he was so true. If I can learn football, who, do, who knew nothing at all, then I can teach math. So, yeah, he changed my attitude about teaching, learning math, and that is still helps me every day in my class. Uh, 
the students, you know, we, we get every time the students say they don't like math, or they don't know how to do math, but they can learn math. We, we can tell them. That's what I learned from uh, Dr. Perlis. Thank you very much. I am happy retirement. If, if not math, I'm sure his granddaughters would make him active all day at the time. Yeah. Thank you very much for everything we have done. Any other of Robert's students would like to come up here and say something? <coughs> Shen Cheng? Okay, uh, <coughs> thank you. Uh, I'm not uh, speaking in front of a lot, so uh, uh, I joined uh, come to LSU in 1983. Uh, has been wandering around and uh, spent a lot of time taking this class and that class and didn't realize the time goes, goes by fast. And, and, uh, at that time, our first was graduate advisor and uh, he kind of reminded me, uh, you need to graduate <laughs> instead of just, just to be a student here. Um, and then and he kind of offered me a, a problem to, to work on it. Uh, but uh, I'm glad, very happy. Happy to work on the diapers and uh, and <laughs> uh, I think uh, he's very kind and very very thoughtful and I like to thank him for his his care and hope he has a wonderful retirement. else would like to say something? Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm Julia Lede. I work in the math department. And I first met Dr. Perlis in the summer of 1986 when I was trying to decide if I was going to come back to school, come back to grad school and go for a master's degree in math. And you were the graduate student advisor, and I remember sitting outside your office waiting for you um, to come in, and you did, and introduced myself, and um, came back to school in 1986, took a class with you. As Tommy Palfrey said, you were fabulous at explaining things. I um, never left the class confused about anything that you went over that day. Um, after I graduated in 1988, got a job here as an instructor, was happy to call you my colleague at that point. When you became chair, I was very happy to call you my boss. And in 2010, when I made the decision to go back to school at Southern University to uh, go for a PhD in science and math education. You were very supportive of that decision and um, I, I thank you a lot for your support in that. And I'm happy to call you my professor, my colleague, and, and now my friend.
Any, anybody else who would like to come up and say something? Uh, okay. Good evening. I'm Katrina Cunningham. I was um, not a graduate student of Dr. Perlis's. I was an undergraduate student. Um, Cunningham is my married name. My maiden name is Ashford. And no, it is not a coincidence because my mother at the time was a graduate student and Dr. Perlis is um, actually first graduate student. And that's how I met him. Um, I had Dr. Perlis for, I think, um, probably Calculus three, And I only had one class with him. And um, what I have experienced in his class, of course, is the generosity of spirit in which he would generously um, give students his time in class, outside of class, and even um, after I graduated, because I graduated um, in 1988 from LSU. And from there, I went to the University of Georgia and, and wasn't happy there. But um, the problems that I had, I was very homesick for, for LSU. And I did call, or my mom called, and encouraged me to call Dr. Perlis. And when I did, he, all, he always answered and was extremely supportive. And from Georgia, I went to St. Louis and got my PhD. I didn't need him there. But when I came back to Southern, um, I became, well, recently a chairperson, program leader. And we actually, um, in a sense, collaborated, I guess, because a couple years ago, I think his last year as <coughs> department chair, we took a picture, thanks to Sula, um, with the um, um, with the baseball team or members of the baseball team, and um, for um, Mathematics Awareness Month that April, and basically, like Mom said, Dr. Perlis has you know of course touched her life and through her touched me, and um, because of his influence on her, on me, um, I try to emulate for my own students because. Of course, as a department chair, I'm also faculty, and, and emulate um, the mentorship he has given me, the generosity of spirit, the generosity of knowledge, because um, one thing I, I, I dearly loved about Dr. Perlis, and still do, is that he's so free with the information, the knowledge, the intellect, that, he, that because he gives it to you and gives it to you freely, you want to pass it on to the next generation and to those coming after you. And so I want to let him know that as he has given to me, I give to others. Thank you so much. Anybody else? I want to say one word. He touched my wife's life. He touched my daughter's life, and he touched my life. God okay, you. thank you. Well, if there's no one else, I think we should invite Robert to come up and speak to us. If you see me getting my slides ready, don't panic with very few of them. There are so many people that I want to thank the, the staff who's helped me for all these years. Kathy and Charlotte and Sula, my co-directors of the REU, Neil and Bill and Jim Madden for a year. Just all of my colleagues. But I thought I'd tell you a short story about how I came to LSU. Is, is it ready to go? So um, I wasn't alone at MIT. Bob Lacks, uh, who was a LSE professor, was there. 
Um, Len Richardson was there and Augusto Nobile was there. In fact, Augusto and I were office mates. I don't know where Bob Latz's office was, but Len was a, was a Moore instructor and his office was directly across the, the hallway from mine. I had a dog named Bartok. Len became great friends with Bartok. And because of that, I became friends with Len. Len was a very deeply into photography and he had his own dark room and I knew nothing about darkroom. So I began following Len around, and he invited me to his apartment and showed me how to use the darkroom and to appreciate great photographers like Ansel Adams. That's important because you'll see that Len Richardson is the reason I came to LSU. That day is darkroom photo labs. And he also introduced me to a place called the Plow and Stars, which was an Irish pub. And there was some thick black drink that I thought was called iced coffee. But it <laughs> turned out it was Guinness Stout. <laughs> After MIT, I went to uh, the University of Regensburg in Germany. And uh, I tried to buy some elephant tusks. <laughs> the story is this. I, I decided to have a, a party for the... The Regensburg math department is very small, and nobody was into socializing, so I thought I'd have a party. And if you have a party, you need toothpicks for the olives and the cherries. And I, my, my German was very rudimentary, and I know the tooth was Zahn, and Dick was Stücke, so I should buy Zahnstücke. But I was learning German by reading uh, children's stories to Alexander at night time, and we had read a story about elephants. And so I went to the store and I looked for toothpicks and I couldn't find them, so I went to the clerk and I said, sorry, is tusks. <laughs> Needless to say, my confidence in speaking German did not grow with that experience. <laughs> My official job title in Regensburg, so I was Neuker's assistant, but I couldn't officially be his assistant because I didn't have a German PhD. So they made me a business <laughs> It took me three years before I could say all those words. After three years, I could say them, so I thought it was time to, time to leave, so I went, <laughs> went to Bonn. In Bonn, I met P Peter Boozer and Noriko Yui, who have been my lifelong friends. And, um, let's see, what's that? Uh, yeah. After five, so I was in Bonn for five years. I, actually, I was there for five times for one year. So. Uh, this was at the so-called Sonderforschungsbereich 40, Special Research Division 40, um, and uh, I was a short-term visitor, so you get a one-year contract, and most people stayed just one year. There were lots of people from Japan and uh, a few from the States. Uh, at the end of the year, Hertzberg asked me if I wanted to become his assistant, and I said, sure, because that's a 10-year position, and uh, the German ministry said, you can't hire an American, you have to hire a German. And that pissed Hirschberg off. And so I, uh, I found in my mailbox a one-year contract extension without asking for it, and the next year I've gotten another one. And so I, I stayed in Bonn for five years, with, and I think I'm the, the longest-term, short-term visitor they ever had. <laughs> I'm quite sure of it because the SFB doesn't exist anymore. It's turned into a Max Planck Institute. In 79, I decided I'd been in Germany for seven years and I had to make a decision either I was going to stay in Europe and try to find a permanent job or come back to the States. So I applied to some jobs in the States and I got interviews at Ann Arbor, St. Louis, and Urbana-Champaign. There's a trick to that for all of it's been any graduate students here. I knew they weren't going to invite me from Germany because they'd have to pay my way. So I wrote to them and said, I'm going to be in your part of the world during this two-week period. Would you like me to give a talk? And since I was coming from this famous institute in Bonn, I had this mystique of 
European is to me. And uh, so I got these three invitations. And then something very important happened. I got a letter from Len Richardson. I hadn't seen Len since his graduate school days. I had heard that he'd gone to some university in the South, but I had no idea where he was. And out of the blue comes this letter, and it says, Dear Robert, I came across your name and your address in a math paper. Now I know why we write math papers. You could, that's how you keep track of your friends. <laughs> so what, what, what are you doing? And I wrote back and said, well, I'm applying for jobs, and I'm going to these three places. And he said, as long as you're coming to the States, why don't you come down South and visit me? So I said, oh, sure and added that to my agenda. And then he wrote back and said, as long as you're coming down south, why don't you give a talk, and we'll be able to pay you some money. And I said, sure. And then he wrote back and said, as long as you're giving a talk, and as long as you're applying to these other places, why don't you apply to LSU as well? <laughs> so I said, sure. <laughs> and of course, I only got one offer from LSU, and it was from LSU, and it was for an associate professorship right off the bat. So thank you very much, Karu, with you in the chair at the time. <laughs> okay. Of course, when I got the offer, offer from LSU, I knew very little about the place. So I went to Hirtzebrug and said, this place called LSU has um, offered me a position. Should I, should I go there? And without blinking, Hirtzebrug said, LSU has the highest standards of any U.S. university. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? <laughs> and he said, they did not give tenure to Eugenio Calabi. <laughs> <laughs> so for those who are not in the know, Calabi is a world famous mathematician whose first job was at LSU, and apparently he was assigned to teach trigonometry. And he had never taught trigonometry before, so he took the book home the night before the class. It was a thin book, and he was surprised to realize that this is a subject without any theorems. You just have Three definitions, sine, cosine, and tangent. as follows. So he taught the course, and when he finished the course, it was a week before midterm. <laughs> and so he said to himself, what should I do? <laughs> maybe, I, maybe, maybe I taught this course a little bit too quickly for the students, so he didn't get enough to the class. I'll teach the course from day, from day one again. <laughs> so he, he started the course the second time, and he taught, taught the course. But since it was a repeat, he went a little bit faster. <laughs> so now it's still a month before the end of the class. <laughs> what can I do? I can't teach the course a third time. <laughs> so we dismissed the students. And of course, these are in the days before computers. You can't just call them back there so quickly. And when the dean, when the dean found out, he called up the chair at the time and said, don't even bring this guy's name up for teaching. <laughs> so we lost the lobby. <laughs> A few things I learned at LSU. I learned that a power series is, is a truncated polynomial. <laughs> I learned this from one of my freshman calculus students. <laughs> I had explained that you have a polynomial that forgets to stop with this power series, and if you truncate them at a certain point, you get a polynomial. So you truncate a power series and get a polynomial. The student insisted on writing, and every assignment he turned in, that when you truncate a, a polynomial, you get a power series. <laughs> this was a good student, otherwise, I said, please explain this to me. And he explained it to me. Now, you have to imagine I've got a board here. Here's a, here's a polynomial, a0 plus a1x plus a2x squared plus a3x cubed, dot, 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 plus anx to the n plus dot, dot, dot. <laughs> If you truncate the dots, <laughs> you get a polynomial of degree n. <laughs> the student said, yes, but if you truncate the xn, <laughs> you get a power series. <laughs> <laughs> absurd, but not ambiguous. <laughs> I can't tell you all, the, I don't have time to tell you the whole story, but I'll tell you briefly. In the second or third year I was at LSU, I got a phone call from somebody I hadn't heard of before, and he says, hello, I'm from the State 
Department of, Re of Revenue. Um, and I got very scared. <laughs> and he says, um, I, I hear that you're an expert in number theory. And I, that got me even more scared because people, <laughs> people attribute great knowledge to you when you have a PhD and they assume that you know lots of statistics and statistical tests. And I said, well, I know something about it. And he said, let me take you to lunch. So he took me to the faculty club and brought me lunch. And now over coffee, I said, what's this about? He says, it's about a court case. It's, it has to do with $600,000 in taxes. And it hinges on the question, is zero over zero ambiguous or absurd? <laughs> Now, just very briefly, it has to do with an international company housed in Louisiana, but whose earnings are worldwide. And the question is, how, what percentage of that company's worldwide earnings are subject to Louisiana taxes? And there's what they call a three-factor formula. There are three things you're supposed to take into consideration, like salaries in Louisiana divided by salaries worldwide, expenses in Louisiana divided by expenses worldwide, and there's a third factor, I forget what it is. And you, in, by law, you have to use, so anyway, you take the average of those three, and that gives you a percentage, and that's the percentage of the salary that, that the worldwide income that's subject to Louisiana taxes. Well, it so happens that this was a so-called holding company. It, it owns other companies outright, but it itself doesn't have a single employee. So, the salaries in Louisiana is zero, the salaries in Louisiana is zero, so you get zero over zero, and the company says that's zero, so you add up the other two and divide by three, because the law says you have to take three factors. But there's a principle in tax law that says, um, if a law, if a, if a law mandate, mandating certain procedure uh, is ambiguous, which means you can legitimately interpret it in, either, in several different ways. The company is legally within its right to interpret it to its own advantage. But <coughs> if something is absurd, then it just doesn't apply the law to the is, is, is in doubt. And so the state says zero over zero is not ambiguous, it's absurd. And the company says zero over zero is ambiguous, we want to call it zero. Of course, if the company had advised me, I'd say, why don't you call it minus a million? <laughs> <laughs> now, here's some, some important advice. The lawyer said, before we go further, how much do you charge? Well, I had no idea. <laughs> so I said, well, maybe about 100, thinking about $100 a day. And the lawyer said, well, that's a little bit expensive for a mathematician. We did hire a chemist at $100 an hour. But, well, I guess you're worth it. So they hired me at $100 an hour, and he said, be prepared to go down to New Orleans. You might have to stand outside the courtroom for a week before they actually call you as a witness. <laughs> and the clock starts the day, the drive time between that and New Orleans counts. Unfortunately, the opposing side sent a lawyer to Baton Rouge, and they had a deposition. They deposed me for about three hours, and at the end of three hours, I settled out of court, and I don't know what the settlement was. So I did too good a job. <laughs> <laughs> Next one. The Einstein Pythagorean theorem. This is something I learned from Bogdan. You all know the Pythagorean theorem. And you know also, you all know Einstein's equation, E equals mc squared. But you probably didn't know that there's an Einstein Pythagorean theorem. <laughs>
much. It's a touch my heart. Thank you all for coming and uh, enjoy your, your evening.